tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Welcome back, friend, and thanks for taking the time to come visit during this busy month. I know you're all agonizing over what to get me for Christmas and all that, but really, what do you get the man who already has everything? Moolah, that's what. Send cash, friends. And plenty of it. Oh, and a Taco Bell gift card for Chester. Come on in, friend. I think we're getting a little ahead of ourselves here. Hmm. Well, that's better. So, tonight we've got a story from a new pal, David Lieb. So, smoke them if you've got them and drink those glasses to the bottom, y'all. Cause old Drew Blood has a tale to tell. But first, the rigmarole. Howdy, you're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu and sign up today. You'll get instant access to the whole kit and caboodle, including millions of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012. Ready to throw your hat in the ring, authors? Send your stories to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, shit, you'll get the full treatment. In tonight's story, we join Sam, who's caught himself a little case of the devil. Happens to the best of us, right? So, without further delay, I give you, from author David Lieb, Salt and Light. When I first saw the devil, he was the size of a flea. A speck of obsidian resting gently on my chest. I stood in the shower, a lanky eleven-year-old, in the last carefree moment of my life. I spotted him there, clinging tightly to my ribs like a tick. I sometimes wonder what would have happened if I hadn't seen him. Would it have been easier not knowing? I didn't think much of it at first. Tried to pick him off, only he began to writhe. His strange and sporadic movements, so apparently evil and unnatural, triggered a primeval revulsion. The panic sank in when he made a tiny cut in my flesh and disappeared beneath my skin. I began to scratch frantically, the water from the shower mingling with the tears now streaming down my face. I didn't understand. What was it? What was in me? I scratched until the skin hung from my chest in ribbons and my blood poured down the sink. Looking down now, I could still see the white raised flesh running my fingers along the smooth ridges of scar tissue. I can remember the pain and anxiety of that moment of the end of my childhood. I don't know how long I was there, but it was long enough for my parents to know something was wrong. I never knew if they heard me crying or didn't hear anything at all, but suddenly my mother was with me. She was holding me close to her, soaking her sweater, shushing me as I collapsed into a shivering puddle in her arms. I remember her crying for my father as I shuddered against her, bleeding. I didn't understand what was happening, and how could I? I was only a boy. They took me to the doctor, my mom and dad, and he bandaged me up. He asked why I had done it, and I explained what I had seen. He listened to me very intently while my mother sat next to me, staring at my face, while hers was a grim mask of concern. My father had left the office and I didn't know why, and she didn't know why, and maybe he didn't know why either. Maybe he didn't want to know what had happened, or already did. The doctor sat, listened, and waited patiently while my mother soothed me as I cried hysterically. He waited for me to calm down, to finish my story. I don't know what it was. I remember sobbing, inconsolable and afraid. But I think it's still in me. It's in my chest. Sam? He finally asked me, his voice level and low. Do you ever have nightmares? 
I nodded at him. Sometimes nightmares can be real, Sam. They crawl right out of our heads into the world and take root in our lives. You did the right thing, Sam, and your mother did the right thing bringing you to me. I'm going to take an x-ray, Sam, and I'm going to take your blood, and I'm going to look in your chest with an ultrasound. If I find evidence that that thing was real, that it was more than just a waking dream, I'll scratch it out of your chest. How's that sound? They showed me the x-ray. There was nothing. They showed me the ultrasound, the first time I had seen one since before my brother was born. Maybe we just can't see it. I had argued, knowing that the thing had to be lurking behind the shapeless gray of the picture. The doctor shook his head. I've read your blood, Sam, and there's nothing. You had a bad dream, a nightmare in the waking world. They're scary, Sam, but they happen. You did the right thing. And with that, he sent me home. My mother sat at the foot of my bed that night and the next, but the night after my brother was up with a bad cough, so she stayed with him. My dad, for his part, picked us up from the doctor's office and hardly mentioned what had happened again. That night, though, he made me hamburgers, and that weekend he let me stay up late with him when my mom was out at choir, and we watched old science fiction movies until I fell asleep on the couch. Things went back to normal for a while. Not for a long time, but long enough so that I didn't think twice when I felt the devil in my hand at school. I had never been violent, never made trouble. I was a sweet kid. I remember that. I remember feeling that way, sweet and nice, and taking pride in that. I remember an older kid pushed me. I didn't know him, and it wasn't a big thing. Just kids being kids. I remember feeling a twitch in my right hand, feeling my fingers curled tight into a fist. I remember splitting his lip and wondering what the hell had happened as a teacher pulled me away from him. That's how the devil operates. First, he works his way into your hand. He wasn't strong yet, so he couldn't move it all the time. But there were small moments when my guard was down. That wasn't the last time I'd throw a punch, and I felt him there every time. I felt him when I shoved my brother later that year, and I felt him when I reached for a knife in the block when my dad started to yell. I was a sweet kid. I was still sweet. That doesn't just go away. I would be terrified after those moments. I would wail out in pain that I didn't know what was happening and didn't know why it was happening to me. For a long time, people forgave me. For a long time, they tried to help. My dad spent every weekend taking me on little day trips, doing activities with me, and I could see how jealous it made my little brother, and that made me sad. Only I loved the attention too. My mom told me how much she loved me, consoled me when I cried late at night. And she took me to therapists, behavioral specialists, and whatever she could think to try. It took a while for me to make the connection, but talk enough about your problems to anyone, and you start to see the patterns. It's a nightmare. I remember saying to one of the endless trains of specialists or child psychologists one afternoon. It crawled into my chest and grew down my arm. He moves my hand sometimes, I think. He makes me do things. The devil, the man had told me, is real. The devil works through men. The devil has taken root in you. What can I do? I asked him. Why is this happening to me? You can resist. You can always resist because, in a righteous body, the devil can make no home. And feeding on a righteous soul... The devil will starve. Maybe he was right, but I don't think so. I don't know what righteous means or what he meant by it anyways, but I was a sweet kid. There wasn't evil in me, wasn't badness, only he didn't go away. 
The more he stuck around, the more I became convinced that what he did was my fault. I was angry, frustrated, and scared, and I turned that all inward. People forgave me for a long time and pitied me, but over time they began to turn. My teachers first, and friends, they were afraid of me, or else they hated me, or else both. Sometimes they would act kind, but always they watched my hand with a suspicious eye, and I knew it, and I knew they were right to do so. My brother hated me next, and I didn't blame him. I struck him repeatedly, stole our parents' attention, and though I sobbed and begged him to forgive me, he was a kid. He wanted a normal life, a normal brother, and I was a burden. My mother and father never hated me, but they hated what I was doing to them. I could see that. They had no time for my brother. They had no time for each other. They had no time for themselves. I was their life, and I was a misery, and I made them miserable. Despite their growing tired and distant, I didn't blame them either. I didn't blame any of them, because more than any of them, I hated me for what I was becoming. I hated myself. I hated myself, became angry and bitter, and filled my chest with that hatred and bitterness. The devil had crawled into me, and then he had made me into his home, a dark and lonely place soured by bitterness and regret. And once it was to his liking, he ate his fill. Soon it was not just my hand that the devil worked, but my legs, arms, head, and heart. I could feel him raise me out of bed in the morning, and I could feel him lay me down every night. I lived like that for many years. I left my home broken, tore my family apart, and never looked back. They were better off, I thought. The devil was there for every man or woman that I hurt. He was there every time I lifted a bottle to my lips or a needle to my arm. He was there, always there. I was an instrument of the devil for many years, a fact I will always have to live with. I don't ask for forgiveness or compassion, but I promise that it is impossible to understand the pain of those years without living through them. Dark and sickly tendrils wrapped up and down every muscle fiber, choked every vein, and tortured every bundle of nerves. At times, I tried to fight his promptings, and the pain was unbelievable. More than that, I had to see with a clear mind what I was doing, and the pain of that was worse. I'm ashamed to admit that I went to sleep for a long time only to protect myself. I think about that time often. In my weakest moments, I even tried to convince myself that it wasn't real, that I was really sleeping, and that it was all a dream. I know that's not true. I know it's an insult to the people I hurt to let myself believe that, and it's selfish and cowardly. I try to remember it often. I remind myself that I was there and knew what he was doing. I say I was asleep and I like to think of it that way sometimes, but only because it's an easy lie. Looking back, I remember times when I would open my eyes and wonder who the hell had made the life I was living. I remembered it, only it was like they were someone else's memories. I had become a cruel person. I was petty and small and I felt small. I brought people into my life and I made them hurt and I knew I was doing it and was glad I was doing it. The devil took my body in those years, but it's a lie to say that he took my mind. Maybe I really couldn't help what I was doing, but to survive it, I made myself into the sort of person who could do those things and walk away from them. I wished I was dead. I should have been dead a thousand times. I tried to end it all, but he would never let me. As dark and insidious as he was, as total as his control over me was, he needed me. I don't think he would ever really die, even if I had the strength to end my own life, 
but he didn't want to start again as a speck of obsidian in the heart of a child. He had plans for me. So it was that I made my way into the world for a long time, hurting people and myself. I would think back to that man years ago, telling me that the devil could take root in the breast of a righteous man. I lost faith that a righteous person could exist until I met Katerina. From the moment I saw her, I knew she was strong in all the ways that I was weak and was steady in all the ways that I had faltered. He knew it too, I could tell, because as drawn as I was to her, so he was repulsed. From the day that she first smiled at me, I felt his barbed grip down my legs convulsing, seizing my muscles, trying to run. For the first time in many years, I stood firm, despite the pain. She saw me, really saw me, past all the misery and bullshit. You're sweet, she said to me, and I laughed bitterly, angrily, as she put her hand on mine. You are, she had said, looking in my eyes, and I remembered the boy that I had been the boy who had taken pride in kindness and despaired in others' misery. And though my muscles tightened and my nerves cried out, I stayed with her. I knew then that I would rather live with his torment than flee and lose her forever. The devil heard my heart and changed his tack, and I felt the shift. Fine, then. He whispered down my spine with the voice of shattered teeth. She's both of ours. As forceful as his first instinct to flee had been, he redoubled his efforts when he decided to make me hurt her. I did my best to choke him back, but he was always there, like when I was a child, waiting for me to drop my guard. In an instant, we could be laughing, and I would feel him clench my fist, and I would run for the door. She saw all of this, despite my shame and efforts to hide him. Unlike my brother, though, she did not come to hate me, and unlike my parents, she did not come to resent me. I don't forgive you, she would whisper. Because there is nothing to forgive, mi amor. I know your heart. Despite her reassurances, I knew that one way or another, he would win out one day. One day, if I gave him enough chances, he would find the right moment. He would hurt her badly enough that it would be the end of both of us, because he hated her every bit as much as I loved her. So I would give him what he had wanted from the start. I would leave her, or else she would finally have enough and would leave me and she'd be right to do it. Not today, though, I would think every morning. Not now, while the air is so sweet with the first blossoms of spring, and the evenings are so dark and cool, and I can feel her nestled into me, not sleeping but not still fully awake. Not now, but soon. Soon. And then it happened the way these things do, and she told me the news. We were going to have a daughter, and at that moment, my world fell apart, and I could feel him swell in my breast, sure now of his victory. She would never leave me now, I knew, and I could never leave her. Our end seemed to be inevitable, and all the more tragic now that we were bringing an innocent into our world. He was hungry for them both. I cried first, and then she did. I told her to leave, and she refused. I rose up to her and roared, and for the first time I saw that she was afraid, really afraid, and it wasn't him she was afraid of, it was me. Again I told her to leave, and between shaky breaths, she gathered her things and left. She would be back, I knew because I would beg her to come back. <laughs> Kill me, I begged him then. Do what you need to with me, and then kill me. Just leave her, please. 
You can have it all, I told him daily. But not that. And with that, he took me again, reveling in the control that I once again relinquished, though our roles had reversed in a sense. He went about his day and choked me back, but when I felt him drift to her, I seized my muscles, dug in my heels, and made both of us hurt. I fell into myself then, into a world where every day was indiscernible from my dreams, and my dreams haunted my every hour. It had been like that before, but it was different now, worse because I saw her in my dreams. Sometimes I was holding her, and sometimes I was hurting her, and both pained me so much I could hardly bear it. Over time, though, I started to have a different dream. I saw the forest sometimes, a long-off memory from visits as a child with my father. At first, only the briefest moments came to me, glimpses of myself walking, haggard and hungry, my feet bleeding and torn. I saw the bird, always, always, always I saw the bird, guiding me, linking the pieces together, making the dream a story. I ignored my waking life, knew that I would feel the quickening in my pulse and the fire in my blood should the devil try to bring me to her, and I focused on the dream. It became real, more real than anything. And as it sharpened in my mind, one day I felt the devil struggling as I walked. And I realized that it was no longer a dream. I had stripped my feet bare and started down the city streets. It was a hot day and I walked for many hours until the city turned into suburbs like the ones I had grown up in. And my skin began to burn. My feet began to ache, blister, and bleed. I did not stop walking as night fell, nor did I stop as the sun rose again. My whole body was in pain, and I didn't know the toll of my march and what punishment he had tried to inflict, but it didn't matter. I was of a singular mind, and strength and force of will I didn't know that I had compelled me to walk on. I walked until the suburbs turned to dirt roads, and the houses turned to trees and I was in the wilderness of my youth, and still, I walked. I walked further than I had ever gone, further than I had ever heard of anyone going. I walked past the fairy circles and the standing stones, deep into the heart of the wild, where I'd been told that no man could return from. I walked until the sky was blood red, shining even through an impossibly thick canopy above me. The air was thick with bird song, and the loamy earth was soft against my broken feet. I walked until I could not walk any longer, and lay down in the dirt. I lay and let the song of the birds blanket me, and decided that the dreams had been sent by some benevolent force to finally bring me to my death, which was good and right. I felt the devil twitch in my chest but knew that he was every bit as exhausted by his struggles against me as I was against him. I thought that it was right that we should lie here, worn and broken together. I closed my eyes and expected never to open them again. The sun red on my face and the bare earth under my back. Soon after, though, I felt the leathery talons on my chest. I ignored them for a while, and though I could feel them both powerful and sharp, they didn't try to hurt me. A crow, black as the night sky, just as proud and terrifying, stands on my chest staring at me. The creature, whatever it was, waited patiently for me to turn my head up, for me to muster the energy to open my eyes, for my vision to clear as I adjusted again to the light. And there he was. His eyes were dark, reflecting the red light and the stars in the sky, and he stared at me, and I knew what he had to do. I was afraid I could feel how strong he was, how surprisingly heavy, but I nodded at him and lifted my shirt. He looked at me a while longer, 
and then without warning, he leaned down and cut into me with his beak just below the rib cage with all the precision of a surgeon. The pain tore through me, a fire in my belly, and I was filled with an agony far greater than I would have expected, only I was afraid to move, afraid that if I did he would cut something he didn't mean to. Instead, I gritted my teeth, filled my hands with the dirt below me, threw my head back, and waited for it all to end. After a while, I felt him lift his head, and I looked down for a moment and saw the blood coming from the wound, thick and black, pouring over my skin in inky rivulets. He leaned down again, then grabbed something and pulled, and the pain was like nothing I had ever known. Whatever he had pulled back, I felt its barbs in every muscle, wrapped around every vein, bundled with every nerve. I felt every muscle spasm as my heart began to race, sweat poured down my face, and the crow continued pulling, pulling, and pulling. I wanted to scream, and I wanted to run, only I knew that the crow would never come for me again and I knew that none of it would give until it all gave. And so I waited still, waited for an end to it, waited for something to give finally. And then, all at once, it did give. In some places I felt it slide free, and in others I felt it snap. But suddenly there was no pulling, and when I dared again to lift my head and look at the crow, I saw the devil in his beak. The crow had held a central mass in its beak, and from that grew a thousand tendrils, some whisper thin and some thicker than my finger. He was dark, oily, and smooth, and seemed to shine red in the light of that place. Some were long and terminated in sharp spiked barbs, Others were broken, some near the end and others near the base. They all oozed blackness into the light. Some dripped on my skin and burned to the touch. All the tendrils jerked and curled erratically, and the knowledge that he had lived inside me for so long filled me with a deep and lingering dread. I don't know. I stared at the crow still, wanting to ask him something. If there was more to get out, and if the blackness that was bleeding still inside me would hurt. Instead, I said nothing, as the steam curled from the wound in my chest, shocked by the pain of what I had just seen. The crow stared at me for a while longer too, and I remember wondering what he was trying to communicate, and wishing desperately that I could speak. Fluid from the devil's bleeding heart ran down his inky feathers, and I was worried that they'd choke the crow. But he was unconcerned. A moment later, he took to wing and flew away, taking the devil with him. I lay there for a long time, not knowing what to do. Finally, I looked again at the hole in my chest and I saw that the blood running from it was bright red, thinner than it had been. I pressed my hand to it, and it hurt, but I could sit up, and once I could sit up, I could stand, and once I could stand, I could walk. I made my way out of those wild lands where no man could wander and return, past the fairy circles and the standing stones along the country roads and through the suburbs and the city streets until I found my way home. I packed my chest with gauze and lay down in my bed alone. And when I woke, I was a new man. And I went to find Katerina. Life marches on. We have a daughter now who looks at me with joy in her heart with eyes that have never seen the worst of me, her mother's eyes. I live my life, but I always watch my hand with a suspicious eye, and I know that I am right to do so because I know in my heart that someday he'll return. 
and I know that the crow can't come again. I watch for a twitch of the finger, ready to destroy the hand, and I watch for the curling of a toe, ready to take the leg. I only pray for my daughter, for my wife, that when he returns, I have the strength to cut him out before he takes root somewhere dearer. And that was Salt and Light by author David Lieb. A good reminder that we've all got our demons, and it's worthwhile to keep on resisting them. In the end, we'll have our reward. Trust me, I know. I'm an electrician turned podcast host. A little about the author. David Lee was born and raised in Santa Cruz, California, and currently resides in the San Francisco Bay Area. He works in engineering and writes short stories focused on self-discovery and the challenges associated with processing trauma and our own darker impulses. He's a fan of psychological horror and surrealism, and occasionally branches out into historical fiction, science fiction, and fantasy. Much appreciated, David. And do old Drew Blood a favor, would you? Subscribe to his podcast wherever you do your listening and leave him a five-star review and a kind word, even if you're listening on YouTube. He needs soldiers on all fronts to win this battle, and he appreciates it. To hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all the other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click Patrons in the upper menu. You'll find yourself at ChillinTalesForDarkNights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to their entire audio archive, all ad-free and available to download or stream. Thank you for your time and for supporting our sponsors. When you support our sponsors, you support this show. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there where you'll get all the latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with them each and every week. Oh, and you can find Drew Blood on Facebook and Instagram, and sometimes Twitter. The Drew Blood's Dark Tales podcast is accepting submissions, friend. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on the show, send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment, 10 bananas. Well, I'm afraid this is where we part ways, at least till next week. So grab a drink for the road, friend, and never fear. The devil can't feed on a righteous body, and let me tell you, your body's pretty righteous. I'd like to say hi to a few more fans of the show. Yvette Montoya, Blair S., and Betty Lynn. Thank y'all for listening to the show and for all the kind comments. It's a real pleasure to know y'all. So, without further delay, Yvette Montoya, Blair S., and Betty Lynn, may the wind be at your back, and may the road rise up to meet you. And remember, if he knows when you're sleeping, and he knows when you're awake, he most definitely knows when you're fucking yourselves. But don't let that stop you. <laughs> Good night, y'all. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.